The topic of putting up walls, taking down walls around your heart was not really my idea, but I've been bumping into so many women lately who are talking about these invisible walls around their heart. It's like, okay, I think we're supposed to maybe look at the Bible, see what kind of direction we get about this. So I've been on a journey in the last 24 hours of putting this together, and you're on a journey with me, and we're going to look at the Bible to see what we can learn. For some of you, though, your hearts kind of look like this tonight picture kind of bruised battered you know you probably used some duct tape trying to keep it together you know just bruised for others your heart kind of looks like this locked up tight like no one is getting in there there is no access to this heart but tonight God wants you to develop a guarded yet open heart you have some walls up but see there's a healthy heart behind the walls and there's actually a way to get access to that heart. A developed, guarded, yet open heart. Our guiding verse tonight, no brainer, Proverbs 4.23. I want to look at it in three different translations, because sometimes looking at, at a verse in different translations just helps you to get a better overview of it. it again, it's Proverbs 4.23. First of all, let's look at it in the NIV. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. In the ESV, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. In the NLT, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. So I thought, okay, I, you know, since we're just kind of parked on this verse, maybe we should try to dig just a little bit deeper. So I looked up some of the original Hebrew words in this verse. That phrase, guard above all else, in the Hebrew is mikol mishmar. I'm probably not saying that even close to correctly, but that's what it looks like. Uh, it means to guard intensely or very closely, as in like a prisoner that you're guarding with utmost diligence. So this is like really guarding closely. And then the ending of the verse talks about, you know, from the heart flow the springs of life. What does this really mean? The springs of life in the original Hebrew is the word chayim which means from the heart, you can draw a map or chart of what a person's life will look like. So think about that. You can draw from the heart, you can draw a map or a chart of what, your, what that person's life will be like. What does all this mean? What we allow to enter our heart will greatly affect the trajectory of our life. Will it not? It will greatly affect the trajectory of your life. This is why God tells us to guard our hearts. Because what we allow to come in affects the trajectory of our life. So what do I mean by that? If you allow disrespect or abuse into your heart, the likely trajectory of your life would be depression, perhaps, or hopelessness, or self-medicating all of that with some kind of addiction because you've let your heart get kind of battered and bruised. Right? That's going to affect the trajectory of your life. If you allow evil influences into your heart, the likely trajectory of your life is a slow breakdown of your character until you start engaging in evil, immoral, or even illegal behavior. That's why we must guard our hearts. Another verse also indicates God wants us to be careful about who we share our hearts with, who we choose to be spiritually vulnerable with, emotionally vulnerable with. Matthew 7, verse 6. God is so descriptive in the Bible. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So you're not just supposed to just hang your heart out there for anyone to just trample all over it. Clearly, God wants us to guard our hearts from the damage that can occur if we leave it just wide open. Right? And then we're battered and bruised. But in what situations does he want us to actually put up walls for our protection? Because sometimes we need again to put up those walls for protection, right? So does the Bible give us any direction on when to put up these kind of protective walls around our heart? Well, yes, the answer, since you asked, let me just tell you that, thanks for asking, guys. Uh, yes, the Bible does give us some clear direction on when we're supposed to put up some walls. Put up walls to keep out evil influences. Put up walls to keep out evil influences. I'm gonna kind of load you up with a little bit of scripture here, and I'm just praying that God would speak to you 
through some of these scriptures that one or two of these scriptures will just kind of grab you and you're like, that was meant for me. That one was meant for me. Proverbs 4.14, do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. Proverbs 22, starting at verse 24. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. 2 Timothy 3. I think we might have even shared this verse last week. It keeps on popping up. Understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. Maybe a wall of protection around your heart so you're not being you're not being influenced by that person. You're not allowing evil to sneak in. Galatians 5, starting in verse 19. Come on in, you can find a seat. Galatians 5, 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, idolatry witchcraft, <laughs> hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are evil influences. Did you catch some of the things in there that our society says, oh, that's not a big deal, but they're evil influences. God's saying, put a little bit of a wall up here. Do not let those evil influences infiltrate your heart. De Deuteronomy 18.10. Do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft. I know all these cute little fanciful cartoons these days. You know, they're just so doggone cute. But you know that half of them have witchcraft in it? Probably more than half of them. And sorcery and all sorts of things. And we're just parking our kids in front of the TV because, you know, we need to get the vacuuming done. So you just park them in front of the TV and it's like, well, we'll flip on the Disney Channel. Oh, boy. Right? Not necessarily a safe option anymore. Don't ask me why I got started on that. But it's true, isn't it, that we have to kind of watch not just our own hearts, but our grandchildren's hearts, our children's hearts. What are we allowing in there? It's kind of clear from this verse in Deuteronomy 18 that witchcraft, fortune telling, sorcery, all these things, not exactly good. Where is God calling you to put up a bit of a protective wall around your heart to keep evil influences out? Is he pointing something out to you right now? Is he pointing something out to you right now? Also, we are to put up walls to protect our heart from abusive people. Abusive people. 1 Corinthians 5.11 I know that you're not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. That's, that kind of sounds like a boundary to me, like a wall, like protection, like, hey, you might want to put up a bit of a, 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 di a distance between you and this person. We're also to put up walls to protect our heart from the lies of the enemy. Speaking of the devil in John 8, 44, Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. And then in 1 Peter 5, starting at verse 8, the Bible says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. So I'm not letting any sneaky lies from the enemy penetrate my heart. I have to be on the alert, and so do you. Be on the alert for those lies that he's whispering to you, like, oh, you know. What, what lie has he whispered to you lately? Put up a wall. Don't let the, his words penetrate. Where has he been lying to you about your identity? You're unlovable. No one really likes you. God doesn't even care about you. Where is he lying to you and you've let that penetrate your mind and your heart? Don't let him sneak in with those lies. Stay on alert. 
Where is he trying to whisper a lie that's going to penetrate your heart and affect the trajectory of your life? We also need to put up walls to protect ourselves from other people's sinful behavior. Right? Is this true? Do you think that's biblical? Well, thanks for asking that question also. <laughs> Matthew 18, starting at verse 15, I know this is such a familiar verse, but I'm just about certain there's someone new watching on Facebook Live who has not heard about this verse in the Bible. So would you allow me, would you indulge me once again to read this verse, because someone needs to hear it tonight. We're not supposed to tolerate sinful behavior against us. It does damage our hearts. And so God says, don't allow it to continue. Here's my evidence. Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. When we were studying this verse over the years, we realized that in the day that this was written to the Jewish people, they shunned pagans and tax collectors. They separated themselves from them. So Jesus is saying, go to this person that's sinning against you, abusing you, do it, whatever the thing is that they're doing, and you ask them to change. If they won't change, you bring others in to bring pressure, a pastor, a counselor, whoever it might be, you're bringing pressure on this person to change, to stop sinning against you. But if they refuse to stop, does God say, oh, well, I guess your heart's just going to have to be battered then? No, God says, you might have to separate yourself from this person. Don't just hang your heart out there to get pummeled. Jesus is saying, put up a separation between the two of you to protect your heart. Do you need to put up a wall in this area, in some area of your life, where someone has been sinning against you? And God's saying, that's not my intention, that your heart would become battered and bruised. Just asking, does someone need to put up a wall in that area? Now it comes the however part of the lesson. <laughs> I call it the however part. A problem often emerges once we start to put up these protective walls. Sometimes, especially if we've been seriously hurt by someone in the past, we keep walls around our hearts forever. And ever and ever. We just never take the walls down. We just leave them up. They served us well for a time. These walls have become comfortable. I'm just going to keep the walls up forever. We never let anyone in for deep fellowship ever again. We miss out on the richness of full emotionally open relationships. We don't really allow anyone to truly know us deeply. We have locked up our heart with a bulletproof padlock. No one is getting in there, right? Remember our picture? Like, no one is getting in there. I'm not going to share my deepest hopes and dreams and fears and insecurities with anyone. I'm not going to be emotionally vulnerable with anyone. I have my walls up. I'm comfortable. I've had these walls forever. And that's been my story, just to be totally honest. Some of you know a little bit of my own story, but a lot of abuse in my childhood, verbal abuse and sexual abuse and pretty much um, I'll just, almost, I guess, would call it emotional abandonment. And so what do you do as a child? Reasonably so, you put up some walls like, I'm not going to let people hurt me. I'm just going to kind of shut people out. I mean, it got so bad for me that I physically would walk around like this so I wouldn't have to look at people. I mean, I, I remember doing that as a child. Weird, huh? But it was like I was carrying my walls to the utmost extreme. Like, I don't want to see anyone. I don't want anyone to see me. I'm just closed off, like even physically closed off. That carried forward into my adult life. I'm still learning to take down those walls. Some of, I don't know if I should say this, but I'm just going to go there because I'm just going to go there apparently. Um, I think sometimes introverts are introverts because we've been hurt in the past and it was just easier to keep people a little bit farther away. I don't know if that's true for all introverts, but, but I don't know. I, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It's like, well, people scary. I'll just kind of keep people far away. Walls that you erected around your heart a long time ago did serve a purpose at the time, but they may be interfering with the rich life God intends for you now. I think we kind of know that, but it, it bears saying out loud. 
that the walls that served a purpose a long time ago, they may be interfering with the rich life God intends for you now. Think about it. How is an old wall you erected, maybe in your childhood, maybe early on in a marriage when, when you had a real problem in your marriage, how has that old wall impacted your current day relationships? Think about that for just a moment with the Holy Spirit. And maybe you can even jot down something that comes to you as you're pondering this with the Holy Spirit. How has an old wall that you put up around your heart impacted you in current day? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you that. Write down your answer. I don't think it takes a lot of time to figure that out, actually. It's like, oh, yeah. I might have kind of shut myself off. I might have closed myself off a little bit from really being open with my husband or my friend or my parents or my sister, right? You kind of shut yourself down and you don't experience that, that intimacy that you really crave because we're, we're designed and wired for intimate connection. Well, we sometimes close ourselves off to that. The truth is that God intends for us to have some protective walls while we also keep our heart available for emotional intimacy. That was our picture that we showed earlier. I think it's up there. Yeah, right? I mean, that we would have a healthy heart, some protective walls, but our heart is still available. Like you can kind of get around that wall and over that wall to have emotional intimacy. God intends marriage to be an extremely deep bond where there is emotional vulnerability and rich closeness. Genesis 2, back in the you know, dawn of creation here, Genesis 2, starting in verse 22, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, she, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. That's pretty close. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now that's vulnerable. Which one of you is like, yeah, I feel really comfortable parading around in front of my husband naked. Come on, let's just be honest. I mean, most of us are like, ah. uh, but Because there's something, it's very vulnerable. It's very vulnerable, right? But Adam and his wife were, were both naked and felt no shame because they, they were just, they were at this place of complete emotional, sexual, spiritual intimacy. That's what God originally designed for us. And for those of you who aren't married, this isn't just about marriage at all. God intends for us to have rich intimacy and mutual encouragement with godly friends. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. We were designed for fellowship. So we know that we should have walls to protect our hearts from these current evil influences, current lies, current abuse, current sinful behavior against us. Notice I'm using the word current. We also know that in order to enjoy the rich intimacy with the others that God intends, that we need to sort of start lowering some of these old protective walls from the past and let others in. So the big question is this, how do we wisely and safely begin lowering some of these old walls? So I was praying about this, like, I don't know the answer. I'm not seeing the answer spelled out very clearly in the Bible, so Lord, I don't know what the answer is to this question. Like, how do you know how to wisely and safely lower these old walls? And like, why would I want to do that anyway? Kind of sounds risky. Kind of sounds scary. Kind of sounds vulnerable. As I was praying about this, I felt God showed me that we will be able to gradually lower our old walls as we trust Him to be our fortress and our strong tower. As we trust Him, not our, not our walls, but as we trust Him to be our fortress and strong tower. When we have a a weak kind of baby relationship with the Lord, then we have to kind of trust ourselves to be on guard. We're, we're just putting all the trust in ourselves. We, have, we were hurt by people in the past, so we feel like we have to construct this huge, permanent bunch of walls to keep harmful people, evil people out. This makes sense to a little child who does not really have a strong connection with Papa God. 
that, that doesn't realize that Papa God is the fortress, is the strong tower. It kind of makes sense if you have this baby relationship, like, well, I guess I just have to do it myself. I just have to keep up these walls, right? But once we seek the Lord with our whole heart, and we begin to realize that we are precious in His sight, that we are His daughters, for real. Like, that He shows us and adopted us, and so we are really the daughters of the Most High King that Almighty God is our Papa, that His Son Jesus loved us so much that He went to the cross to take the penalty for our sins, then we become secure in His love and we realize this amazing God that you're like part of the Red Sea, you know, and He was able to shut the mouths of lions and manna from heaven when people were hungry, like this amazing God is probably able to protect me, that I can be secure enough to rest in His protection. We can trust Him to be enough to protect our hearts in every situation. We can trust that even if people say something mean to us or disrespectful to us, Papa God will help us quickly deflect any lies from the enemy. They don't even stick anymore. Because right away, Papa God is right there with me because I'm so connected to Him. He's right there with me saying, oh, that's a lie. You don't need to just let that bounce right off. That person's just having a bad day or whatever. They're frustrated with their own life. That's why they took it out on you. Just let that just let that go. Don't even let that stick because Papa God's right there helping me as my fortress and my strong tower. We can trust that we're so connected to Papa God that we can actually be in close proximity to some evil people and yet remain completely unstained. We don't even need to put up as many protective walls becomes, because He becomes our protective wall. I think this is what He's trying to tell us over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture in so many different ways. Can I share a couple of ways with you? 2 Samuel 20, 22, starting at verse 3. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge, my Savior. Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Psalm 18.2. The Lord is my rock, my faith fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon forged against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and this is the vindication from me, declares the Lord. So tonight, just to bring it home here, God is telling some of us to actually establish some new walls in a relationship. Perhaps you've been hanging around people who are displaying immoral, evil behavior, and God wants you to spend less time with them. Or perhaps you've been allowing someone to verbally or emotionally abuse you, and God wants you to establish a boundary to protect your heart. Perhaps you've been listening to lies of the enemy about your identity, and you've been repeating those lies inside your head, and God is saying, stop, this is an enemy tactic, notice this is the enemy, don't allow him in, put up a protective wall. But also tonight, God is telling some of us it's time to take down an old wall that's been around our heart. Perhaps the invisible wall you put up in your child is, maybe it was due to a father wound or a mother wound, and maybe that wall needs to be slowly dismantled so that you can enjoy a richer relationship with your husband or your friend or your sister or whoever. Perhaps the invisible wall you put up is from just like six months ago or a year ago with your husband after he, you know, betrayed you in some way. And maybe this wall now needs to be slowly dismantled if your husband has repented and is working on restoring your trust. It needs to be slowly lowered back down. So I want to leave you with just a couple final tips on this, on lowering some of these old walls. And you know, before we go any further here, we're almost done by the way, um, how many of you sense that you have had an old wall around your heart to some extent? I'd just like to see a show of hands. Just kind of curious. Yeah. That's what I thought. It's pretty, pretty common. So if you're thinking it might be time to just start lowering the wall a little bit, a couple of tips for you. Keep in mind that it's best to take small steps forward to test the waters of emotional vulnerability and openness in the relationship. Take it slowly. You don't just bring the wall, come crashing down, you know, like, I just want to confess everything I've ever done wrong and every, all my fears and failures and hopes and dreams and my, you know, I hope it's safe in your hands. Take it slowly. Maybe disclose a little bit at a time. Let the other person know that you're going to be doing something really difficult by risking emotional vulnerability and ask them ahead of time before you make more of these kind of like deep disclosures, ask them to treat your heart with tender care. 
Let them know that you're taking a risk, that this is kind of difficult for you, and you really, really need them to treat your heart with tender care. Make it your goal to slowly let your true self be known to that person. Your true feelings. Your deepest fears. Your insecurities. Your failures. Your hopes. Your dreams. This actually paves the way for rich emotional intimacy. And then tip four, use some suggested conversation starter questions to develop that deeper emotional intimacy, whether it's with your husband or a friend or sister or whatever, and agree ahead of time to avoid criticizing or correcting each other as you're responding. Just agree to be good listeners. So to help you with that, some of you already know, they're like already looking under the trays at the table. So underneath your trays on your table, and I'll tell you how to get this on Facebook Live in one second. Underneath your trays on your table, there is a list for each of you of conversation starter questions. And these are not just for marriage. This is for like a good friend or a sister or someone that you think, you know, I'd like to, to develop a deeper connection, to be fully known by this person. Because we all are wired to be fully known by other people, to have that deep fellowship, that deep bond where the wall is down and our heart can actually enter into deep fellowship. So utilize these questions, have a little date with your, you know, coffee date with your friend or coffee date with your husband and start talking through some of these questions together. And for those of you on Facebook Live, I made this available on the Squadron of Sisters website, which is squadronofsisters.com. Just click on the lesson tab, or lesson handouts tab. And then you'll, no, not, not that tab, I take that back. Under the free resources tab, you'll see a PDF that you can print out for free. So there you go, there you have it. Let me pray for all of you guys. Lord, I just pray that uh, whatever was from you tonight for each woman, that, that that would penetrate each woman's heart and stay there, Lord, and take root. Lord, I pray that you give us courage to establish walls that need to be established. Lord, that you give us courage to take down some old walls that need to be taken down, Lord. Show us when it's safe to do so and how to slowly lower those old walls. Lord, I pray for each woman in this room that she would find a deeper level of emotional connection and intimacy with the people in her life. In Jesus' name I'm asking this. Amen. Amen.